Are you interested in the fundamental questions about the nature of the universe? That's what cosmologists do for a living. They're a small group, but deal with some of the universe's biggest questions. Cosmology is the science of how the universe came to be and is. It's also a discipline that some say is in crisis. To help us understand what's at stake and why it should matter to the non-scientists among us, we welcome the co-authors of the book, The Singular Universe and the Reality of Time. Here's Lee Smolin, a founding member and faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario. And we welcome back via Skype from Brasilia, Brazil, Roberto Mangabeira Unger, professor of law at Harvard University when he's not, as he is now, serving as Brazil's Minister of Strategic Affairs. And Lee, it's good to have you back as well. You were Steve, here. Steve, it's very nice to be back. You were here four years ago as well for uh, our, our program where we talked about how the universe works. So let's just... Let's go back to the beginning here, shall we, Lee? For starters, the Big Bang, you the origins the of our Big universe. Bang is the beginning. Okay, well, that's what I want. That was my first question. Was the Big Bang, in fact, the the beginning of everything? Well, of course, Steve. Because this is science, we have to say we don't know. We have to confess our ignorance. But it seems unlikely. And let's put it this way: if the Big Bang is the beginning of everything, it leaves all the most important questions unanswered. Because the universe, as it were, springs into being from nothing with all these laws and particles and forces and fields intact, where did they come from? And the universe begins, quote, or just after the Big Bang, the universe is in an extraordinarily special state, we've learned. It's very unlikely that if the universe created according to the laws of general relativity and quantum theory would have the features of our universe. So there are two questions. Why these laws? Why not other laws? And why the starting conditions? Why not other starting conditions? And if the Big Bang is the first moment of time, we simply have to become mystics and give up hope of answering those questions. Do you think those questions will be answered in your lifetime, or some of them, or any of them? One hopes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were some of the scenarios as to what was before the Big Bang? Well, what we know is that as we go back, the universe is getting hotter and denser. So there is some event which is very energetic, very hot, from which the universe emerges expanding. It's natural to think that just before then it was contracting. And just like a ball bouncing off this table would bounce down and go back up again, the universe might have bounced. And indeed, it's not a new idea. It's an idea that goes back to the 1950s and 1960s, the effects of quantum mechanics, which are so far left out of the equations of cosmology, would cause the universe to bounce. Let me quote uh, Roberto Unger uh, from the introduction of your book. You say, the most important thing about the natural world is that it is what it is and not something else. So how does that help us better understand our world? Uh, what we attempt to do in this book, uh, seen from a certain angle, is to overturn that second notion, the notion that was reaffirmed by 20th century physics, uh, and to say, we have no reason in science, no good reason to create an exemption from the rule of time. And to suppose that there's a part of nature which is immutable and must be the way that it is. Everything in nature changes sooner or later. Our best hope of explaining the world is to explain it historically. Nature is what it is now because it was what it was before. Okay, Lee Smolin, can I follow up with this? Is there one universe? For sure there's one universe. There's not more than one universe. If there were more than one universe, it wouldn't have anything to do with ours. What we mean by universe is a history of events, of things that happen that are connected to each other by causes, by my knocking on this table causes the sound to go out. And the universe is a single system of causes which leads to the things that we observe. If there are other systems of causes disconnected from ours, there's nothing to do with ours. It wouldn't cause anything in our universe, and it would be completely irrelevant for explaining things in our universe. So as a scientist, I say there is one universe because that's all I can be concerned with. But also, 
it seems to me that those friends and colleagues of mine who like to these days talk about multi-universes are engaging in a departure from science. They're engaging in a call on mythology and mysticism. Well, that's what I was going to get to, because obviously there, there is a debate within cosmology as to whether or not you're right about one universe. Maybe there's more. There is a debate, unfortunately. Why unfortunately? Because this is a point on which I think that I'm a big fan of debate and disagreement in science. That's how we reach progress. That's how we know that we've made progress, is when we turn a corner from disagreement to consensus. But the nature of science requires explanations which are testable, which have consequences which can be tested to find out if you're right or not. It's not enough. Science is not about what might be the case. Science is not about fairy tales. Science is about what you can demonstrate from the evidence is the case, and what is the evidence is something that affects us causally. Okay, in which case, Roberto, let me ask Steve. you. Yes, let me Steve, just, just a, you want to come in on that? Yes, just to follow up on that point. Uh, so why is there this idea of multiple universes? Uh, one of the main reasons why this idea has been embraced is that it helps redefine a scientific defeat as a scientific triumph. So uh, many of the now dominant theories, for example, in particle physics, are compatible with many more states of nature than we in fact observe. Uh, and therefore, there has been the temptation to say, well, all of those unobserved states of nature that are compatible with the now dominant theories must be realized in the unobserved universes. That's why this idea of the multiverse was embraced. Uh, and so what that idea is doing is trying to turn a setback into a victory uh, to redefine an enigma as a solution. That's not how science can advance. Science needs to treasure its enigmas and to confront them head on. Uh, the, the much more reliable basis on which to go forward is to suppose that the only world is the world with which we can hope to have some causal contact. And in this world that we observe, time touches everything. Nothing is exempt from time. If, if you don't like the idea, or you say there's no evidence for the idea of multi-universes, what about sequential universes, one after another after another, as We're opposed to... We're fine with that. You're fine with that. And when you're asking what was before the Big Bang, you're asking the question of what state was the universe in before the Big Bang. And that could be, it's just a matter of nomenclature, whether you call that a previous phase or stage of our universe, or whether you call it another universe. But the whole idea is that if we allow ourselves to go before the Big Bang, we can hope to explain what the conditions are at the Big Bang and after the Big Bang in a way that's scientific, in a way that has implications for things that we can observe. Here's another quote from the book, and uh, Minister Ungel, I'll, I'll get you to comment on this. Uh, you say, among the greatest and the most startling discoveries of science in recent times, are discoveries about the universe and its history. The most important such discovery is that the universe has a history. Why is that so startling? Well, because the major theories of 20th century physics, relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, emerged before we knew that the universe has a history. Uh, and then the subsequent course of science has been an attempt to reconcile the historical character of the universe with these fundamentally ahistorical theories. One of the main arguments in this book is that we have to distinguish in science what science has actually discovered about the universe from the gloss of philosophical assumption and prejudice through which we read these discoveries about nature. So 
we don't have to repudiate either relativity or quantum mechanics. What we have to do is to interpret them in a different way, to interpret them in a way that doesn't make them depend on the ideas of rational necessity or of immutable laws. Lee, another quote from the book. Time is real. It is the most real feature of the world. Who's that aimed at? Who's that aimed at? Mm -hmm. Everybody. Because we scientists have to disabuse people of so many common notions. The air seems to be smooth, but we say it's made of atoms. This tabletop is hard, but we say it's mostly empty. It's atoms floating in seas of electric charges. And we take away from the common experience and insert a kind of story, which has, however, the backing of evidence and explanation behind it. So when we say that time is really real, we say that of all the things that we experience, the one aspect of what we experience that goes all the way down that won't have to be replaced and turn out to arise from something else is the experience of time, of the present moment, of things occurring in the moment, of the flow of moments, of the chain, chain of causes and flows that we experience. Does that, uh, take, um, does that take aim at Albert Einstein? Does it contradict him? It contradicts some of the things that Einstein said, but at other times Einstein regretted the loss of the moment or the present moment or the now as he called it. He regretted deeply in conversation with the philosopher Rudolf Carnap. He regretted deeply that general relativity didn't contain a notion of the now or the present in it. Hmm. Roberto Unger, here's a quote for you now. That time is inclusive and real as well means that nothing in nature lasts forever. Everything changes sooner or later, including change itself. What is that? What is this, that? Help me with that last part. Including change itself refers to what? So time is about change. Mm -hmm. And if nothing is exempt from time, that means that the way that things change must itself change, that there's no permanent set of ways in which change takes place. Now, we're actually familiar with that idea in the life sciences and in the study of humanity and of human history. But we're not accustomed to think in that way in fundamental physics. And we have, in general, an approach to knowledge that imagines that theoretical physics, that this tradition of theoretical physics, which appeals to the notion of timeless laws, is the gold standard of science. And that all the other forms of insight in biology or in history are somehow inferior. They are dilutions of this higher level of scientific ambition. There is no longer any basis for that. We need to begin to think about the world historically and to take time seriously, to pursue to the hilt the thesis that nothing stands outside the sway of time. Uh, and that, then, is the mission of contemporary cosmology. That intellectual endeavor has a tremendous significance for us. If, indeed, uh, time were illusory, uh, or somehow qualified in its reality, there would be a basic disconnection between our experience of the world, of our own lives, and of ourselves, and the ultimate nature of reality. And we would then be imprisoned in a cosmos built on principles fundamentally antagonistic to our experience. We need not believe in such an antagonism. OK, Lee, if that is true, you're going to have to help me out here again. If everything is subject to change, including the physical laws which we have lived with and understood to be true for the last hundreds, if not thousands, of years, could the law of gravity be changed? Sure. But it's important to emphasize cosmology takes a long time. So the scale on which we imagine the laws change is huge compared to common experience. 
And it becomes then the job of a scientist, let me emphasize what Roberto just said, becomes the mission of science now, not just to produce a new dogma that the laws change. We're interested in explanation, not dogma, but to make concrete proposals. What laws change? How do they change? How can we test the hypothesis that they've changed? So when you're saying that so, we have to allow for, the, for, for a longer space of time to understand these, you're not looking for a new theory of gravity by a week Tuesday. You're thinking what? Dozens, hundreds well, the, of years down the road? There's a difference between the time scale for human discovery, which of course is unknown. The future is open. That's the one thing I certainly learned from this project with Roberto. The future is open in every possible way, including the time scale for discovery of new laws of nature. But let, just to throw something out, we're in the course of a huge revolution that Einstein started. It's not true that Einstein made a revolution with relativity and then with quantum mechanics. And then science has been boring since 1925. Science has been in the course of a revolution since 1905, a profound and dramatic revolution which is going to change our conception of everything. So what's the latest chapter of the revolution? Well, a necessary chapter is the realization that time is real and laws evolve. But just to give a contrast, the last time there was a revolution of this consequence in science was the Newtonian revolution, which began with Copernicus in the 1450s and ended in the 1680s. So it was more than 100 years. 500 years, so, 600 years. So, no, 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 130 yeah. years. I see. Roberto so Unger, Steve, you wanted to come back on Steve, that? Yes, yeah, Steve, an, a, a, a useful clarification is this. Ch change is discontinuous. Uh, nature, the universe, uh, goes through different states. So we uh, now live in a cool down universe that has a relatively stable structure and relatively stable regularities. But we have reason to think that nature was once very different in its super dense and super hot state. It was subject to much more rapid change and it did not exhibit the, sa the stable structure that it now shows us. So we we cannot develop a view of nature which is simply the expression or the projection of this particular state of nature that we observe in the cool down universe. We have to imagine nature as capable of radical transmutation in the course of its evolution. Lee Smolin, I've seen you quoted as having said you think cosmology is in a state of crisis now. For sure. What does it mean for an entire discipline to be in a state of crisis? Cosmology has two parts. There's an observational part, which has been dramatically successful. We now know a great deal about the history of the universe, close to, back to close to the Big Bang. And it is, as Roberto says, the big discovery is that it has a history. It was always evolving, always changing, always different. But we theorists, have attempted to explain and have insight into why it was like that. And there's so many questions which have arisen. For example, the universe is dominated right now by dark energy. It's a form of energy which was not predicted by theorists. Why? And why the amount? And the universe has a great deal of unseen matter, dark matter. Why? And then the questions that I began with, the why these laws rather than a multitude, an infinite number of other possible laws. Why these starting conditions rather than an infinite multitude of other conditions? So we've, we've succeeded to the point where we're able to enunciate questions that we're not capable of answering with the common methods that we've been using. And that constitutes a crisis? That constitutes a crisis when you're so successful that you go off a kind of conceptual cliff and you can no longer use the same methods that you got to do to identify the questions that are so important. When you can't answer the key questions, you're in a crisis. And when that goes on for 30, 40, 50 years, you better recognize that you're in a crisis or you're, you're just going to spin your wheels. Roberto Unger, do you agree we're in a crisis now? Yes, Steve, and I'd say that there are, there are at least two other aspects to the crisis in addition to the ones that Lee just, just mentioned. The prevailing practice in, in cosmology 
has been to treat cosmology as simply a kind of scaled up physics. So we take the dominant theories about patches of nature and we scale them up to the whole universe. And that turns out to be an inadequate approach, especially if the universe has a history and if, every, if everything in it is shaped by this history. Cosmology cannot be conducted. It's simply scaled up physics. Another aspect of the crisis is that these views that we contest are in large part an expression of a certain view of the relation of physics to mathematics. Mathematics has been the, uh, the, the immensely powerful tool of natural science. But in exchange for its enormous advantages, it has exacted price. It has given physics this poisoned chalice of the idea of immutable laws standing outside the reach of time. And mathematics has been treated as the prophet of science and the oracle of nature. The truth about mathematics is that the usefulness of mathematics is related to its selectivity. Mathematics is best seen as a visionary exploration of a proxy for the world, a counterfeit version of the world from which time and particularity have been sucked out. Mathematics is good at some things and bad at other things. The program for cosmology that we propose is a program that requires a radical revision of our understanding of the relation of physics to mathematics. Hmm. Lee, what I thought you might say when I asked you whether or not cosmology was in a state of crisis had more to do with the, say, scientific illiteracy of most of the population that people who do what you do serve. Do you think that's in a state of crisis as well? There is a lot of ignorance out there, but there's also enormous interest. The fact that Roberto and I can write a book like this and we can be discussing it in a program like this means that there's interest. You're interested. Your program is interested. In fact, when you were on this program with five other physicists, I think, and we're going back four years now, I think we had 90,000 hits on, uh, online for people watching that program. 90,000 to watch an hour-long discussion about theoretical physics. There is a deep interest in fundamental physics and cosmology because we're the ones who answer the most deepest long-term questions. What is the universe? Where does it come from? What is truly fundamental? Where does meaning come from? And finally, although we're not touching on it in this program, why is the universe hospitable to life? Why are we here in this universe? Uh, Roberto, but, in, in but, your view, is scientific literacy only about science? Uh, Steve, I'd rather like to answer from another direction, sure. and follow up to the last exchange, uh, and say this. Uh, uh, our lives are dreamlike and groundless. We don't, we don't know the framework of existence. Uh, uh, there's a good reason and a, a bad reason for the uh, enormous popular interest in in cosmology. The good reason is that we want to understand as much as we can about our situation in the world. But the bad reason is the false hope that we can find in science an escape from the groundlessness of our existence. That in science, we will have a solution to the enigma of life. That we will peer into the beginning and the end of time and understand the framework of everything. We won't. Uh, and uh, science will not relieve us from the torment of our groundlessness. If science attempts to do that, if it attempts to deduce the world from rational, uh, from rational necessity, it succumbs to a perversion and destroys its legitimate power. OK, but do you? Do I, I presume you think science isn't, scientific literacy isn't just about understanding science, 
that it also presumably leads us to a greater understanding of society and human affairs as well. Is that fair to say? Scientific, scientific literacy is about understanding both the power and the limits of our understanding. Uh, and so here in, in this discussion about cosmology, we are dealing with the most general science. And this is something truly fantastic that we are able to progress in our understanding, not just of pieces of nature, but of the universe as a whole. At the same time, however, uh, it is imperative that we not mistake this possibility of progress in our most general insight with an ability to understand the ultimate framework of being, the beginning and the end of time, the reason for things. Science cannot do that. The sci science, science must, must stop short of the, uh, of the claims of religion and of the pretenses of metaphysics. To appreciate science, to do science, you have to be willing to confess ignorance. You have to be willing to say, I don't know, even if it's something that you're dying to know. And I may never know. And you might never know. Science starts when the confession of ignorance begins. And what I heard Roberto say is that the problem with the politics of the United States and other dominant countries is that they think they know the right way to organize society. And the strength of Brazil, for, from Roberto, you can tell me if I'm reading in too much, the strength of Brazil is that Brazilian politics is more open because you're willing to say, we don't know the future, let's experiment, let's discover right. the best way to organize society. Correct. So, so in politics, vitality needs an ally. The ally of vitality is the imagination, especially the institutional imagination. And in science, what we desire is the marriage of empiricism with theoretical vision. The enemy of this marriage of empiricism with theoretical vision are the hardened systems that we have inherited from the past that are mixtures of a kind of congealed philosophy with the empirical hardcore of science. Sometimes it is necessary to dissolve this combination of crystallized theory with hardcore empirical insight, to liberate our insight and to put it under the prism of an alternative theoretical view. That's what we attempt to do in this book. Hmm. Lee, I want to have a bit of a nerd off with you right here, okay? So for <laughs> his win. Well, I don't know, because we're different kinds of nerds. I'm a more of a history nerd, so this past weekend uh, was the Ides of March, which yeah. is a pretty big day on the calendar for those who uh, remember Julius Caesar was uh, assassinated on that day. On the other hand, it was also Pi Day this past weekend. 3.1415, March 14th, 2015. Pi, the mathematical formula. And I guess there's some folks out there, and you know, there was a lot of chatter on Twitter. I don't know if you're on Twitter. But I'm not. You're not. Well, there's a lot of chatter on Twitter among uh, some sci science nerds about how this is kind of a neat way to teach science to people who may not be terribly scientifically literate, because if you say to them with a catchy idea, hey, it's Pi Day, what's Pi Day? Well, 3.1415. Oh, okay, so what's Pi? And then you go on like that. Uh, do you, is that helpful? to your quest to get more people scientifically literate? Anything is helpful. If that helps, let it be. But let's emphasize the most interesting thing about pi, that the number goes on and on and on and on and on forever. and on and on forever. It does. And that almost all the numbers go on and on and on and on forever with no pattern, which means, and here's something that blows me away about the, the real numbers, Almost every real number is unnameable, is unspecifiable, because it goes on and on and on and on and on without pattern, without reason, without rationality. So even a simple thing like the numbers are filled with an infinite amount of mystery and discovery. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, in our remaining 10 minutes or so here, get down to, it's, it's interesting, in five, almost 550 pages in your book, uh, you two have your share of disagreements. And uh, let's get into some of them. Roberto, um, you disagree 
that science is either the sole or the most reliable source of insight into nature. If not science, then what gives us a better sense of what, ma what makes nature tick? We have different ways of approaching the world in art, in religion, uh, in philosophy, and in science. Uh, there's no certain hierarchy of these different ways of, of understanding the world. Uh, scientism is the belief that science is supreme, that it has the prerogative over our other approaches to reality. But I say, scientism stands to science as militarism stands to the army. Scientism does science no favors. You make the analogy to militarism, so your You've got, a, you've got a, a red caution flag up, is that right? So scientism is a, a, an imperial extrapolation of science. Uh, to do science, we don't need to affirm the supremacy of science over other forms of insight and experience. Uh, scientism is not a scientific theory. It is a philosophical or pseudo-religious proposition. Hmm. Okay, Lee, a pseudo-religious proposition. You on with that? Well, science is a choice. Science begins when you, as I said, confess your ignorance and you begin to open up to doubt and then you begin to ask for methods which can alleviate your doubt. Science is always provisional. Science is always temporary. But I don't hear you describing it as a pseudo-religious proposition. We're not talking did. there about science, Steve. We're talking about scientism. Scientism, so okay. Th so one thing is science. The other thing is the claim that science enjoys a unique priority over all other forms of experience and insight. I see. That's not a scientific proposition. That's a proposition outside science about science. I understand now, okay. And you make a choice. Now, when I want to understand something about life, about parenthood, or marriage, or friendship, or mentorship. I don't go to read the scientists. I don't read the professional psychologists and so forth. I read novels. I go to the theater. I listen to music. So I, I don't have a deep disagreement with Roberto here. I think we may put, the, we come from very different traditions, Roberto and I, and we say things differently, but fundamentally, the idea that science, like everything that gives insight, is a choice. It's an ethical choice that human beings adopt, which gets us enormous benefit. But that doesn't mean that it's to be mystified or worshipped. What's one thing you two did disagree about strenuously in this book? I think we disagreed most strenuously. I know, I'm aware that this is being taped. <laughs> We disagreed about strategy. Meaning what? Meaning that I am more willing to take a hypothesis which partially achieves our aims and doesn't fully achieve our aims and examine it as a scientific hypothesis. For example, the certain ideas about how the laws might have evolved that I've explored. And Roberto will point out correctly that that doesn't achieve all the aims that we set out. That that is making a kind of compromise. But for me, doing science is always provisional, is always giving up a little bit to get something. Roberto, why is that approach problematic for you? So let's take that as an example. So Lee, for example, says, uh, let's think about the history of laws from a Darwinian standpoint. There's a natural selection in the evolution of the laws of the universe. I answer. Uh, to be coherent with our point of view, we can't suppose that there is a master mechanism of change, in this case, a kind of Darwinian mechanism of change, because our view is that everything changes, including change itself. So uh, I vote for pushing our ideas at every point to their radical extremes. 
I am a revolutionary by conviction as well as by temperament. Which I guess gives me the moment to say I'm an evolutionary. <laughs> Not a revolutionary. Well, I've done enough in my life that was considered revolutionary, but with the example and the role model of Roberto, I just have to give way to a true revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> one, one letter makes all the difference, eh? <laughs> no, one, no one would believe that characterization seeing me on the screen sitting in this office. But so be it. Those are the paradoxes of life. <laughs> Very good. Well, Roberto, <laughs> let me follow up with this. How do you explain the persistence of religious beliefs which prevent people, for example, this is back in the news all the time now, which prevent people from accepting ideas around the theory of evolution? Uh, I recently published another book called The Religion of the Future, which is the development of the same philosophical program uh, in a different register. Uh, there is, there is the properly understood, uh, there is no contrast between religion and, and philosophy and, and science. Uh, there is no contradiction between uh, a, a religious view and a scientific view. Uh, just as science should not be mistaken for scientism, uh, a religious view that uh, depends on uh, unfounded conjectures about the natural world is a perversion of religion, a kind of pseudo-religion. Uh, it's a, a, a heap of superstitions. Uh, to, to be revolutionary in science, we must also be revolutionary in religion. But that would be another conversation. Uh, okay, fair enough. But uh, do, do I assume that you have trouble with those, Lee, who believe that the world is 5,000 years old and that uh, evolution never happened? I feel sorry for them. How come? Because ignorance is never good. And ignorance they wouldn't call ignorance it ignorance. They'd call it faith. But that's not faith. They're making statements about the world that are false. In a democracy, we're tolerant of other people's faiths, but you don't, as to quote somebody, I think Richard Dawkins, you don't, actually it's not Richard, I forget who said this, you don't, you're entitled to your opinion, you're entitled to your faith, you're entitled to your aspirations, you're not entitled to your own set of facts. And I know certainly people who consider themselves and would be considered deeply religious people, deeply spiritual people, and they don't have any problem with the facts as we have understood them. Evolution and biology is a fact, it's not an opinion. And if you have a conception of God which is in conflict with that, then your conception of God, I hate to say it, is in trouble. But I know many deeply religious people who have no trouble with that because they have a conception of God which is compatible with the facts, which has to be compatible with the facts. I think it was, uh, you're right, it wasn't Dawkins, I think it was Pat Moynihan, the former senator from New York, who might have said that. You're entitled to your own this, you're entitled to your own that, you're not entitled to your own facts. Yeah. Might have been him. So, so religion embraces our understanding of nature, but hmm. attempts to project beyond that understanding in, into a territory into which science cannot advance. In our last minute here, Lee, um, the Perimeter Institute, does the quest for the search for the theory of everything continue forever? We're in a crisis in fundamental physics and cosmology. Perimeter has a unique opportunity to be on the forefront of that crisis and to encourage brave revolutionary attempts to resolve that crisis. Perimeter wasn't created in a vacuum. Perimeter was created at this particular moment and has the possibility of playing a great role because we have the flexibility and the vision that we have to have scientists who every day are conscious of the crisis and conscious of the challenge to make breakthroughs. Hmm. 
Let, and let me ask one more thing. I'm going to beg the control room's indulgence for one more question here, which is, you two have collaborated on this book, but uh, you two seem to have almost nothing in common other than your shared passion for this subject. Uh, the way you dress, where you're from, the way you speak, the way you look, uh, your approach to some of these issues. <laughs> Roberto, how did you get along with this guy and manage to put 550 pages together with him? No, it's been a terrific experience of, of, of collaboration, of affinity, uh, drawn together by a convergent intellectual program, but also by deep sympathies. Uh, so although we might not look similar or sound <laughs> similar, uh, there's a great deal of shared humanity between us. Lee, last word on that? Absolutely. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a deep privilege to work with Roberto, one of the people who inspired me as a role model for many years before I met him, but especially to share so many things. Because the other things are superficial. And there is one thing we share, which I've never mentioned to Roberto. We both spent time as children in New York City. And that must be everything. That's the connection. It should be clear on the screen that we, that we both uh, uh, sound and think in some ways like New Yorkers. <laughs> Very good. We leave it there with a tribute to the Big Apple. Uh, my thanks to Roberto Manguevera Unger, professor of law at Harvard, now Brazil's Minister of Strategic Affairs, for joining us via Skype from Brasilia, and Lee Smolin from the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario. Great to have both of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.